today. Um, Karen, I want to especially say thank you to you and um, invite you also to remove from mute. I'm going to say a few words and then we're going to turn things over to Karen to take us into today's topic. Um, let me start by saying what a pleasure it is to have her with us. Um, when I think of people who really understand this topic of coaching across cultures, it is um, no doubt that Karen is one of the top people who comes to my mind. So it's a pleasure to have you, Karen, and we're going to be learning as fast as we can in the short time we have together. Um, I'm going to begin with just a little bit of an overview from the work that we've done, uh, not only at NEBO, but also at Georgetown at the Institute for Transformational Leadership. And I would like to just say that um, as we think about transformational leadership and sort of what does it really mean to grow as a leader, uh, whether it's because you're working with a coach or whether it's through the experiences you're having, when we think about what it means as a coach to help somebody um, reach another level of um, effectiveness and success in what they're doing, we really have developed a simple model that I think is very powerful. And Karen will be working with some aspects of this model today. So I thought I would share it with you. Um, the first idea here is that, you know, many people think about leadership. They think about leadership is about what do you get done? And I think what we've learned and have really wanted to emphasize in our work at, at NEBO and again at, at the Institute for Transformational Leadership is that it's not just what can you do, it's also, you know, what can you see? And how do you speak, right? What do you say? Uh, what, how do you communicate? And what's your way of being? And when you think about those four ideas, each of which is worthy of its own webinar, I might add, um, today's focus is really going to be about helping us Think about how to see the distinctions that are really critical when we're coaching across cultures, or especially coaching um, across a culture that may be new to us. Um, I think we also can think about this in terms of leaders leading diverse organizations or stepping into a new position in an organization where the culture is new to you, um, leading people who come from different cultures, right? So. What do you need to be able to think about and be competent at in order to be effective with people who, um, who are part of a culture that may be different than your own? So today we're gonna to be really um, starting with uh, how to see the uniqueness of a culture. And then we're gonna to move to some of the key competencies and skills that you might want to cultivate in yourself as a coach or a leader so that you can be more adept as you lead across cultures. So Karen, with no further ado, I'm gonna um, invite you to, um, to uh, begin to take us into the webinar. And I think we have a question here, which is an invitation for chat from folks on the webinar. Um, we're gonna then do a poll. Yeah, so thank you, uh, Kate and Izzy. And, and I'm so happy to be in this conversation with you all on this topic that's so uh, near and dear to my heart. This is a, this is a topic that grabbed my attention at a very young age, which I think is true of a lot of people who are pulled into this, where we encounter difference young and got curious about how people work or don't work across differences, such as cultural differences. So this is part of a long-term uh, focus for me, and I'm so happy uh, to get your input and to learn from you as I share some distinctions as well. Before we dive into definitions and distinctions though, we wanted to start with this question that you see on the screen right now. What are some of the cultures that are present in your work? And uh, go from whatever your current understanding of culture is. We'll define that in just a moment. Just go with how you understand it right now. What are some examples of cultures that are present, that you're aware of, that you know are influencing things, whether those cultures be in you or in other people. And if you can just enter in the chat some examples so we have some to work with, that would be great. Thanks so much, Karen. So as Karen said, feel free to type in your answers in your chat or Q&A function. And we are gonna sign off video for the moment, but rest assured we will still be here and we'll join you back face-to-face -face during the question and answer session. So we have some answers that are beginning to come in and we have overall firm culture, department culture, client service, 
executive team culture. We have white culture, race. We have a, one answer, which is Southern culture. We also have culture from Asia, Mexico, North America. One respondent said meeting culture, global clients and colleagues, gender, black culture. One respondent said culture formed by my history and experience working with other people. So you can see the responses are flowing in now. We have yeah, American yeah. culture, exclusive slash inclusive culture, mm -hmm. LGBTQ culture, academic culture, Catholic culture, analytical culture, any culture related to religion, nonverbal communication, culture related to age, related to hierarchy. Wow a male dominated culture, culture based on the amount of years you've been at a company, socioeconomic, socioeconomic backgrounds, unit culture and university culture. Yeah, so, I'm gonna jump in here, Izzy. Yeah. So you're getting the impression you can see from this wide, a uh, swath of responses where we're touching so many different issues that the topic we're sitting in today in this conversation is both far reaching and deep. It is, has breadth and depth to it and a lot of complexity. Many of the researchers who have looked at this topic have said the way we can navigate in this complexity is by identifying some distinctions, some places to look where I can identify if we are similar or different. And then once I can see that distinction, that similarity or difference between us, that cultural dimension, then we have a chance of working more effectively together. So you're going to see in many of the um, uh, specific uh, models that, that we will briefly look at today, that they're providing us with some language, some places to be curious. My invitation and my challenge to you is whatever it is you just answered in that chat, and there are so many different answers uh, still coming in, I'd like you to keep one of those situations in mind or one of those relationships in mind as we look at the dimensions of culture, just to check, is this element of culture affecting my way of communicating in this situation or with this person? Is this a place for me to be curious? Is there a shift I can make that would make things even stronger or improve things if they're not strong right now? So please keep your specific situation in mind as we continue forward. Um, I love the breadth of the, the responses. And you all already know, it sounds like, that culture is more than country culture. Although national culture is a big um, element of how we think, and it's often dropped. It's often not paid attention to. And uh, other elements of culture are focused on. Gert Hofstede is one of the best known researchers and writers on this topic. And he defined culture as the collective programming of the mind that distinguishes the members of one group or category of people from others. It's interesting use of words, collective programming of the mind. I like the definition, the one that I'm offering is that culture is the way we've been taught to see and engage with the world. And in this definition, the word see, I don't mean just the physical act of using my eyeballs to take in data, but I mean the uh, how we've been taught to make sense of the information that my eyes are bringing into my brain. So it's it's got this interpretation element to it. So culture is the way we've been taught to see and interpret and engage and respond uh, with the world in front of us. So you can see many of the examples that you listed fall into that definition uh, beautifully. 
So we wanted to hear from you. Be, uh, culture affects so many different dimensions of leading and managing. And for the coaches on the call, it affects so many dimensions of our coaching work as well. Where would you say are the biggest pain points for you, the biggest challenges when you're leading and managing or coaching uh, from the standpoint of culture? Where, where does culture seem to present some difficulties for you? Is it in conflict management, decision making, managing performance, or one of these other options that you see here? And we have a, an other at the bottom in case there's some element that we didn't list there that's really important to you. Where does culture present the biggest challenges for you? Go ahead and select the one that seems most true for you. And we will leave the poll question up in your Zoom windows for the next 30 seconds. So if you haven't had the opportunity to click in your vote, please go ahead and do that now. And then we'll get the chance to look at the collective input all together. So about 10 more seconds. And again, for those of you entering your responses in the chat, go ahead and actually click on the poll square, the rectangle you see with the poll options over the selection you would make. I just wanna make sure your vote gets counted. Perfect. So we're gonna do about five more seconds for anyone who hasn't had the chance to vote yet, and then we'll take a look. All right, put in those final votes now and we will see what we've got. So here are the poll results on the screen and Kate and Karen, I'm curious, it looks like communications has popped up as you know, one of the biggest pain points and we also see decision making and then conflict management and leading change coming in in kind of the third slot. So what do you make of this? Well, I would say looking at it, I'm not surprised at all, in part because I think the idea of communication really covers a lot of these other things as well. Um, so that is a, a great choice for people to make. I think certainly um, communicate, when I think of my own work as a coach, the challenge of communicating in a way that is effective and understood and not misinterpreted or um, uh, evaluated from, from a different cultural lens in a way that's different than the intent of the speaker or the writer um, is often a concern that I hear. And I'm a little bit surprised um, to see managing performance to be at 10%. And I think that that could simply be another um, related aspect of communication. But I think sometimes um, one of the places where I see cultural difference is the question, how do we define success in our work? And so sometimes culture is a factor in uh, what, we, what we believe we're working toward, what, how we define success, uh, what we think is most important there. So that's an interesting one for me. Yeah, for me as well. I was noticing the managing performance one as well because I so often hear that how I give feedback or don't give feedback how we, how I coach as a leader and manager are um, directly affected by culture. How my staff member might receive that information is culturally determined as well. So I was surprised at that one as well and not surprised that communications made top of the list uh, in part because it applies to so many situations and relationships right to all of them i'd love uh by the way adam smith put i think it's peter drucker who i can't remember who said this but i think it might have been him who said culture eats strategy for breakfast um and and it might have been lunch i can't remember which meal um, culture culture does but the point adam i think you're making and i would agree is um uh, is that culture affects all of these dimensions and many others. There's a fairly new book out, a couple of them, uh, you'll see reference to them later, that talk about these different dimensions of leading and managing that also affect us as coaches, that give even more detail about um, the impact of culture on these specific aspects of leading and managing one called the seven mental images of national culture is kind of an interesting one and the other is the culture map 
Uh, both of those get, for those of you who are interested in taking this further, both of those books are, I believe, good resources to provoke thinking and evoke some new insights for you. So I'd recommend them. Okay. Yeah, so, I'm going to keep um, going, um, Karen, but one thought that keeps coming to me that I'll share is when I think about communication as, and I would probably remove the S and just make it more broad there, but when I think about communication as our number one choice, I'm reminded of being a young woman in a senior leadership role, um, kind of at an early age and entering a culture where debate and argument was really valued. And both my I'll call it my my cult my small town upbringing culture, right? Combined with um, the the, tra the the training and perspective that my family and others had given me about not interrupting, really worked against me. It, I had to learn how to get my voice heard and how to get in in as a as a contributor in those meetings because it was a culture where interrupting and debate and speaking over others was actually seen as lively and positive. And that was very challenging for me. Um, but I share that tiny story with you because I think it, 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 you know, these are concepts, right? But when we actually think about the places where we, um, we find ourselves struggling or feeling somehow missed, um, often there's a, a cultural piece there. Yeah, and the shift, Kate, that you described that you made there is not always small because we're talking about deeply embedded learning that happens for most of us in the first 10 years of life. And uh, in fact, some of the researchers would say it's like down to the bones embedded in us, the, how we're taught to, what's, uh, how we're taught to communicate, how, what is polite, what is rude. When is it okay to speak up? When is it not okay to speak up? These things that you so easily mentioned just now, actually, if they're well um, embedded in your bones, it's difficult to shift out of them. So it does require some amount of effort to first become aware of these differences and then to choose to make a shift if you do, and then to actually make the shift. These Each of these steps for me uh, require uh, enormous self-awareness. Yeah. Culture is a funny thing. You know, many people talk about the iceberg an, uh, analogy for culture. I think uh, Hall, Edward T. Hall was the first person to coin this term. I'm not sure of that though. But the, I love the image of this though, because it shows us that a small piece of our culture that is informing us and speaking to us all the time and determining our actions and our thoughts, a small piece of it is visible to others, what uh, some call external culture, but there's this much larger piece that is below the water, internal culture. Mm -hmm. And internal culture is so um, full for us, there's so, so much there. Whereas external might take the form of dress or whether or not I make eye, co eye contact with you when I speak with you, or do I shake hands or not shake hands on first meeting? Those are examples of external culture uh, being demonstrated. Internal culture includes things that are um, um, meaty, <laughs> I would say, like values. That's a big piece of what's under the water. Education and views on education might be there. History, who are heroes and what is considered heroic? Who are tyrants and what is considered tyrannical? Um, what, um, what is appropriate for a supervisor or a manager to do when he or she notices that something has been done incorrectly. Mm -hmm. Some of that makes its way to the surface. We see the behavior eventually, but there is a lot going on under the surface before we see any evidence above the surface. Kate, were you about to say something there? Yeah, I was. Thank you, Karen. I, I'm looking at the quote, and I, I've been thinking about this a lot, actually, in the work that I do. And it's specifically about the fact that what it hides, what culture hides, it hides most effectively from its own participants. You know, the idea that we're sort of, we're like fish swimming in the water. We don't notice the water, right? We're so accustomed to the culture we're in. We don't see it even because it, we're so acclimated to it that it's, uh, it's us in a way. And I, I wonder if you could say that better than I just did. I'm not sure I can say it better than you just get, did. I love what you said. Um, the, 
it is interesting in my work and in my life, my own, uh, the cultures from which I come were not evident to me until I encountered someone who didn't share them. I don't know if that's true for, I don't know if that's true for others on this call, but it's so often the case that it's when I encounter difference that I come to know myself better. And in fact, I think the rest of this quote from Edward Hall uh, goes on to say something like, I'm convinced, he said, I won't have the quote quite perfectly, but it's something like, I'm convinced that this work is really about coming to know our own culture. And I think that's really true. As we talk about gaining awareness and competence in working interculturally, we are very much talking about increasing our awareness of our own norms, of our own way of thinking, of our own way of engaging with the world. So uh, Edward T. Hall is the probably, I don't know if he was the first, but certainly one of the first people to study intercultural dynamics. In fact, some people uh, give him credit for being the person who started interpersonal communications as a discipline and profession and area of study. Uh, and he looked at culture from many different perspectives, but there were three in particular that got his attention. My invitation to you all is as we do a quick hop on these three, and as we look at the next slide, a couple of items from the next slide, again, think back to your situation where you were identifying what cultures are present for you right now, that whatever that situation or relationship was, and consider, are there elements of context, time or space, for example, on this slide, that are influencing that situation or that relationship? So uh, context, according to Hall, and the way he defines it, he sorted cultures uh, as either low context or high context. And this is a measure of whether or of how much, the extent to which someone pays attention to the context, the environment, the uh, culture that is playing in a conversation compared with the words that are being spoken. In a high context culture, the person uh, who is from a high context culture will give a lot of credence to the context and actually uh, in very high context cultures, there's a belief that I can't understand your words unless I know the context from which they're coming. Whereas a low context culture will more uh, likely take the words literally and get meaning, derive meaning from the actual explicit language that is being spoken. So, for example, if I'm in a conversation and the other person says, yes, I'll do that for you, if I'm in a low context culture, I will have heard yes, and I'm going to assume you're going to do that for me, whatever that thing is. In a high context culture, that may or may not be true. I may hear your yes in a very different way. In fact, I may even hear that you're saying yes for some environmental reason, but your real answer is is maybe or your real answer is no. So low and high context cultures in his studies, uh, he was able to sort cultures according to whether or not they pay attention to that context or not. Time for him, uh, he sorted it as polychronic and monochronic. Polychronic mean uh, the way it demonstrates itself is that people from polychronic cultures often do many things at the same time. There's, a, there's a, a sense in polychronic cultures that time actually is in flow, that it comes from an infinite past through the present to an infinite future, and we don't lose it, actually. We're in the flow of it, whereas in monochronic cultures, it is uh, more likely that the, a member of that culture will think that time happens in sequence. So we do step one, then we do step two, then we do step three. When, we, when this minute is over, we've quote unquote lost it. Whereas in polychronic cultures, there's, there, there's not that sense of losing. A lot of time management approaches are based in monochronic cultural thinking. The last area Hall looked at that we're highlighting today anyway is space. And 
this idea of how much private space do I need, we kind of have the sense, you probably have experienced conversations where the other required less or more private space than you did, and this sense of territoriality, whether I own my space or not. Um, I remember when I started working with a Chilean company, my um, the, our sense of space from some of my Chilean colleagues was so very different from mine. And I remember having the feeling, I don't think it was actually true, but I had the feeling that they were hugging and kissing and touching me all the time. In reality, I don't think that's what was happening. But because my sense of private space was much greater than theirs, in those early days, I had to really uh, kind of relax and take some breaths as my own US and German heritage, which required a bit more private space than that, of course, uh, reared its uh, reared up and and uh, made those moments awkward for me. Whereas I think for my colleagues, they weren't awkward at all. They were quite normal. So these are just three dimensions. Hofstede, Gert Hofstede is another uh, researcher and writer, and I'd say he's probably the best known of all of them. I may have mentioned that earlier. He identified these cultural values dimensions. If you Google cultural competence, you will find there are a few instruments out there that measure it. Almost all of them come from Hofstede's uh, values dimensions. You'll see references to individualism and collectivism, to long-term orientation, to indulgent and restrained. You'll see this language that he uh, created through his research. Uh, I remember, oh, can you go back uh, for a second, please, Izzy? One, one quick thing I just wanted to highlight to give an example of, of how these play out, the, uh, just to highlight two of them, low power distance versus high power distance and individualism and collectivism. When I was, um, getting ready for today, one of the experiences I had came back uh, from memory uh, as an example of how the these distinctions actually very practically show up and not always in comfortable ways. I was working in the office of the cultural, uh, excuse me, commercial attache in Kenya, and I was bothered by how the Kenyan staff who also worked there would treat me like I was some, in my cultural assessment, some kind of queen, some kind of high, high ranking person, when in reality, I had one of the lowest ranking jobs <laughs> in the mission. So I was very surprised when every day I was greeted with handshakes. They stopped whatever they were doing. They came up to me, they shook my hand, they greeted me in a, for me, very formal way. And if I needed anything or made any requests, they dropped what they were doing, they got it for me. They, it was a very disconcerting for me. And one of the things I believe now looking back that was going on is a distinction between low power distance and high power distance. This is the extent that um, less powerful members of society except that power is distributed unequally. I know that's a mouthful. So this is the extent to which someone in a lower uh, power position accepts and expects that there will be differences in power. The power is not gonna be equally shared by all. In the US, our level of power distance is significantly lower than in Kenya. So in Kenya, translating that, the, the um, acceptance and the expectation that there will be power differences was much stronger than it would be from a US cultural norm. In addition, uh, the US has a very strong, one of the strongest individualist cultures in the world, which is where we identify ourselves starting with the word I, as opposed to the word we, which would be more collectivist, where we see ourselves as individuals as opposed to as members of a group. And Kenya has more of a collectivist culture. So these two in combination had my colleagues, my Kenyan colleagues seeing me, first of all, in a, a, a as a member of a group connected to the Foreign Service, 
which they assessed was uh, putting me at a higher level and then very being very comfortable with power distance that of course people will not hold power equally then the act of uh, deference the many actions of deference that they exhibited were aligned with their culture in fact it may have felt disrespectful for them to operate differently no matter how uncomfortable i may have been with those same behaviors so it's interesting how these play out and they work together uh, these different uh, values dimensions. So there are some newer voices. So those were two of the classics. There are other classics, by the way. Some of my favorites are Stella Ting Toomey. Love her work. Um, uh, Fonce Trompenars has uh, a very strong leadership and management focus in his intercultural research. Also quite strong. And, and there are others as well. Some of the newer books that are coming out are the ones you see on the slide now. Uh, the um, Seven Mental Images of National Culture I mentioned earlier is an interesting book that acknowledges the connections across Hofstede's different dimensions. It's interesting what he's proposing. And he uh, puts in his book the, I don't know if he would call it a complaint, but it, I read it as a complaint that often in diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, culture is left off. Cultural assumptions are kept implicit as though everyone would see um, things in exactly the same way. So he has a very interesting, for those of you who are interested in equity and inclusion work, as I am, I think his book gives a lot of food for thought, whether we agree or not is a different story. And then Gemma Watt, uh, Myths of Globalization, another uh, wonderful book. I put him on here partly because I love his language, Globaloni and Technotrance. Uh, he is, his research is showing that we, that many are overstating the impact of globalization on cultural differences. Uh, Globaloni for him is this persistent tendency to overstate how globalized the world is and that there's so much possible uh, if we only uh, continue to globalize and, and expand. Technotrans being an incorrect belief that new technology actually is getting rid of cultural differences. He shows how those things are both myths in his book. So it's kind of interesting. Again, these are some, some newer uh, thinking. And then the last new one uh, on the next one, the culture map, which comes from Aaron Meyer. Uh, I mentioned earlier as well, for those of you interested in seeing even more detail and examples around these different aspects of managing and leading and how that plays out in multicultural and multinational settings. It gives you a lot of examples. Uh, so I really provided those newer voices just to give you uh, some a taste of what else is out there. I think there's much more research to do. I think we're we're facing some big questions. These are just some of them. These offered by Ting Tumi and her colleague, Liva Chung. Um, gadgets and technology, television, virtual teams, social networking, and so much more is shaping how we do things, how they will change us, how these shapings will be different from one culture to another is yet to be seen. And, and I know there's some current research being done on these, these things, it's not, uh, research I'm involved in, but it's, I can't wait to, to see what's discovered. <coughs> so we wanted to throw the question back to you because I've been running through a bunch of um, uh, distinctions just now. What are some of the things you already do that you know support your success when leading or coaching across cultures? We're about to uh, move into the strategy few minutes of our webinar and we wanted to hear from you first because we know that many people drawn to a webinar like this are doing some great things already have some strategies that are working for them so we would love to take just a moment to hear from you and if you have things to contribute please put them in the chat and Izzy will uh, read them out for us thanks Karen so the first great piece of advice is listen carefully, which I know at Nebo, we think listening is an extremely important skill in leadership. So that's a great one. 
We also have creating a culture of inclusivity and listening as well. So listening comes up again. Yep. So we have listen pop up again, and then we have probe for underlying assumptions, learn the history, gather many perspectives. And then this person has a, a department team mantra, and that mantra is act out, and it embodies characteristics of success across all cultures. I would be interested to learn more about that one. Yeah, Rod, if you can put in what the acronym stands for, that would be wonderful. We also have being transparent and sharing information and asking questions to make sure you understand. We know that listening and asking questions go hand in hand. Um, being open, being curious. We also have acknowledging, acknowledging cultural stories. I think that's a really important one. Yeah, I'd like to add one um, as we're taking them in and mine is simply notice where you are not landing well with another. Mm -hmm. And instead of a, sort of assessing that they're not getting it, you might ask yourself, what, what, how, how else might I say this? Or what's the barrier to being heard here? What do I need to know or ask so that I better understand? Yeah. What might I be blind to right now? Yeah. Yeah. Or another participant added the question, how could I be wrong? Or what do I believe? Nice. Yeah. Love that. Seek first to understand and then to be understood. That was Covey's idea is another thought from a participant. Mm -hmm. So there are some good, some good thoughts there. Yeah, love it. Uh, we also have some good thoughts from other sources. We are including in our uh, slides, which I know you'll receive uh, after the webinar is over, uh, reference to these. For the coaches on the call, the ICF, the International Coach Federation, has provided us with a little bit of language, some new competency language that talk, talks about how to um, respect and create a uh, respectful environment for different cultures. The language they use, and I think it's uh, valid, the reason we are including it here is it's valid for leaders as well this language. And when you get the slides, you'll see the specifics in the notes section of the slide. Um, for demonstrates ethical practice, just to give a couple examples, the new language is, is sensitive to clients' identity, environment, experiences, values, and beliefs. Just imagine as a manager or leader, if you're sensitive to client, your staff members' identities, environment, experiences, values, and beliefs, what a difference that makes in the level of trust you have with your staff member and that, then what's possible with them. Uh, cultivates trust and safety has many as well that also talk about respecting identity, environment, uh, values and beliefs and listening actively, uh, very similar. So ICF has given us a, a few tips uh, that we can use and there are people who, others who have provided us with suggestions as well. Uh, you, I've already told you I love the work of Stella Ting Toomey. Uh, this comes from her and, and um, uh, Dr. Chung. Uh, so if, what are the qualities of an effective intercultural communicator and how perfect it is since communication was the number one pain point that we talked about earlier. So what are those qualities that we can um, work toward and continue to develop in ourselves in stronger ways. So we're, we need to be adaptive and flexible, as some of you said in the chat room. Aware of separate ethnocentric realities. We need to be creative and experimental and not be afraid to do that. Slow to judge verbal and nonverbal communications. That's such a true one, really putting into slow-mo uh, our, our judgments. Being self-aware and others. We have some deliberate practices uh, as well, uh, and uh, you can go ahead and click to the next slide, Izzy, for me, whoever's doing the slides. And we have subtle ones. So there are things you can do that are very visible, and there are things that are more subtle. And many of the suggestions that you put into the chat box, I would put in both, actually. Um, noticing moments of disconnection that Kate brought up is here. Noticing patterns of reaction in the other um, is something to be watching for. 
starting to notice your own ethnocentrism, this belief that my culture is the best and it knows better than others. And uh, our own bias busting work. Now that line is like looks so simple. And I think we all know this is a lifelong journey uh, doing that work. Izzy, you can go ahead and click to the next. So a culturally sensitive leader and coach for me chooses and returns to love and care as general orientation, not fear and reaction. Many of you or some of you on this call have heard me say that before. Uh, this is such an important piece to me. When I encounter a difference that is unnerving or frustrating or confusing, making sure that rather than doing a reactive snap judgment in response to it, I slow myself down as Stella Ting Tumi recommends that we do and I choose to move from a sense of care. Culturally sensitive leaders and coaches are also humble, culturally humble, such an important concept. There's, a, there's been a lot written about cultural humility lately. I think it's really good work. Uh, yet bold, there are moments when we've got to be experimental, we've got to step forward. Uh, a culturally sensitive leader or coach also does their own work and acknowledges and values their own cultural roots and teachers and recognizes what Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, this beautiful language she gave to us, intersectionality, this interplay of a person's multiple identities. And I would expand Crenshaw's original intended meaning, I think, of that word to include um, so many of the, all of the dimensions that you listed in our first question here, where you, where I asked what are the uh, elements of culture that are, that are uh, present for you. And then finally, a culturally sensitive leader and coach knows how to shift focus back to the other in difficult or confusing moments, rather than it being all about that leader or coach. And we can certainly trip ourselves up when we make it about us in some way and exclusively about us. So uh, trying to pull everything together before we open things up for questions. The things to remember for us, and I say us because I know Kate and uh, Izzy had a, a big hand in creating this summary statement, developing your ability to lead or coach across cultures is really about learning how to see with new eyes. And the way we do that is by having distinctions. The models such as Edward T. Hall provides for us, Hofstede, Trompenars, Stella Ting Tumi, and so many others, those models provide us with ways to see, things to look for, the, the elements to focus on so that we can um, improve the communications that we're having and the relationships that we have. Learning to see differently in this way requires empathy, cultural humility, a ton of curiosity and courage. And as I mentioned a few moments ago, this is a lifelong pursuit. I'm often, uh, I often think I'm so glad that I have a whole lifetime to work this because apparently I need it <laughs> as new learning keeps cropping up. So uh, Kate and uh, Izzy, I'll, I'll turn this back over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Karen. Well, for all of you online with us, that wraps up the 45 minutes of content we had prepared for you. We are gonna stay on for a few more minutes and answer some questions if you have any. So feel free to start chatting those. And Karen, thank you so much for giving us that wonderful overview. We will send all of this great work to the participants so that they can go back and do some of their own research. So we have one question to start off, and the question is, how will coach training organizations train for these competencies? How will coach training organizations train for uh, cultural competencies, or is, is the person referring to the new ICF identity language competencies? That's a good question. If that person could follow up with a uh, specifics, but I think the question may have popped up around the time that the ICF slide was up. 
So I, I'll say a couple words about this. Kate, you may have some thoughts on this as well. Um, I know that ICF, and this is this, I'm these comments are directed to the coaches on the call. ICF has given the schools who are training coaches two years to revamp their curriculum to integrate and, and teach to the new competencies. So you may not see it this year because these competencies just came out. Um, a few months ago, right? Was it November? I can't remember what month it was. So from whenever that release date was, there's a two-year period of preparation for that. Kate, would you add anything to that? I, I think that uh, many schools have been actively exploring how to um, better include and integrate these, these competencies into the their core programs. And I know that Georgetown, for example, has been spending quite a lot of time over the past two years, even before these competencies came out. And yet, I think that um, the times are such that it's gonna be crucial that whether we're leaders or coaches, we are understanding that we need these distinctions that Karen was beginning to give us today and that uh, we're working in a global society, we're working in diverse um, workplaces where there's lots of different perspectives. And it's really going to be critical for all of us to um, find our, our learning paths. And I think one of our one of the things I was excited about today, Karen, is that you provided lots of theorists. So for those of us who are, you know, looking for places to go to learn more, um, I would definitely encourage you to look at what's been provided here. Um, I have the urge to sort of list lots of other resources, and maybe we could put some of that together for you in the follow up email. Sounds good. One thing I'll add to that too is um, the, maybe it's a homework assignment for everyone, a possible homework assignment. The models that, uh, that I chose to put in this short webinar are also ones that you can use to do some self-assessment work. The slide where you saw a bunch of horizontal lines that showed Hofstede's different uh, dichotomies, those dimensions of uh, values, dimensions of culture, you can use that to literally plot where you think you land between uh, individualism and collectivism, for example, between high power distance and low power distance. You can plot yourself and then plot the cultures within which you're working or the others with whom you work. So you can literally plot and see for yourself where the biggest gaps may be and where attention may be needed. I, I, I use those, um, those horizontal lines often for that. They remind me of things to look for. Yeah. Okay. Karen, as, as, we, as we kind of come to the close, I also want to really emphasize the point that you made a minute ago about cultural humility. And I think what that allows us to do is acknowledge that we are learners, we're beginners, no matter how much we know, and that even well-intended, we may um, make mistakes or speak across or act across culture in a way that's not effective, right? And I think part of, part of embarking upon this learning journey is being willing to humbly, you know, say thank you for the learning and, and continue on, right? Even when you might feel um, discouraged or even embarrassed by something that happens. I think there's a kind of resilience needed in this um, learn, kind of learning. Um, and I think that cultural humility is a wonderful idea for us to, to take with us. Yeah, great. So we have two more questions and then I'd like to invite anyone who has further questions to send us an email. Uh, one participant is looking for suggestions for introducing the discussion of cultural differences when it's noticed as a source of disconnect in a supervisory or coaching relationship. Could you read it one more time at the beginning of the question? Sure. So how do you introduce the discussion of cultural difference as a potential pain point in either a supervisor relationship or a coaching relationship? Yeah, well, I'm, that's a great question. Uh, many ways. <laughs> it's, what's, it's what's coming into my brain. Um, and it depends. It also is also coming into my brain. Um, you know, one way, and again, Izzy and Kate, feel free to jump in as well. And other listeners, uh, uh, jump in if you've got ideas for this person as well. But I think the what's important to me in this is, is what Kate was just talking about. 
the approach in, the way you're being, as you're trying to introduce this idea that there are different ways of seeing things and interpreting the world. Um, people who come in with, a, I'm not saying that you are, but I've seen some folks who come in with a, like I've got this right kind of attitude, tend to shut down the other. But if you can come in with humility and say, and offer, you know, I know that there are many ways that, that uh, one may look at this, and there may be cultural dimensions that are playing in here. If you can do that introduction in a humble way, I think in many situations that will serve you. Mm -hmm. I think a good, a, a good other um, idea might simply be to say um, whatever it is you need to say and then say, how does that land for you? and leave that open, right? So that someone can say, I'm not getting that, or I, I'm uncomfortable with that. You know, I think part of it is creating a, uh, especially in a supervisory relationship, creating a safety such that um, you're a supervisor who people could say, I disagree, or I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that, right? So I think if in a really hierarchical culture, sometimes people sit on their true feelings because they, don't feel certain it's that that power different power issue again, right? So I, I would say, you know, you could ask yourself, um, I think I loved your first response, like many ways, and it depends, right? So you have to ask yourself, what's the way to create, to open the door to this conversation in a way that feels um, accessible and, and safe for the, for the other person, right? And I think a whole, someone said to me recently, like, I want to say something to you, once I say it, what will happen, right? And so my, my realization was we actually needed to talk about my openness to hearing it so that it could be said. And, and I, think, I think my response to that statement was, I really wanna hear what you say. I can't, I'm not sure, I don't know what you're gonna say, what, what, how I'll react, but my intent is to receive, right? I really wanna hear. And so I think, I think sometimes we have to have a little bit of conversation to get into the conversation, but um, this is a, again, like a, a path worth pursuing, just learning how to, how to step down, how to step back, how to open up and, and engage. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So one last question, and this person is interested in the impact of cross-cultural understanding in DEI work and wondering if you have any resources that pop to mind so that they can learn a little bit more. Yeah, I would recommend the two, so personally, and Kate and Izzy, feel free to add yours as well. Um, I would add the two that I mentioned, these two new ones, because I think there's an increasing look at them. So the seven mental images one, and you'll see it again in the slides and the culture map. I think both of them, um, provoke a bit um, our thinking about that. Um, there's also another book out there. There are two others that I would recommend. One's not as new. Um, the New Global Roadmap, uh, also quoted earlier, the Global Oni and Technotrance author, uh, might have some information. But um, Stella Ting Tumi and <laughs> Leva Chung also put together, and I have it right here, this beautiful, um, expensive, but beautiful book that pulls together DEI and um, international dimensions of culture beautifully. They've done such a nice job. And it's called Understanding Intercultural Communication. It's uh, quite good. And we have um, a suggestion from one of our participants and it, is Sukari is a Georgetown resource. Absolutely, yes. Yes, um, Sukari leads our um, diversity strategy program in the Institute for Transformational Leadership at Georgetown. It's a wonderful certificate program that really is a great uh, place to go deep and learn a lot and learn how to think strategically about the, this, this set of issues. I'd also like to mention a couple of other um, local resources. One, another one through the Institute for Transformational Leadership is the New Normal Initiative, which is really about uh, opening up a conversation between black and white people um, about race. And they have developed a, a short workshop and also a year long group study uh, to that end. It's a really, really valuable um, experience. And the last one I'll mention, um, whose work I greatly admire, is um, the 
um, sorry, I'm looking to get the names right here, um, is the Baltimore Racial Justice Action Group. Um, they do beautiful work and offer um, a, a variety of programs, including an eight part um, experience that really opens eyes to uh, the existence of structural racism and how that really affects our relationships and our culture. So the resources are, are growing actually yes. at this time. And it's a wonderful time to, um, to uh, step back and really think about this, uh, I would say identity, culture, systems, right? How does it all work together? It certainly affects us in our work as coaches and leaders. And I think the, the more understanding you have, the more humble you'll be, but also um, maybe the more, more confident you'll be in um, exploring this more. Wonderful. And I will say as a participant of one of the new normal initiatives, the woke workshop, it was a conversation and a day that uh, I reflect back on all the time. It was very powerful. Yeah. So with that, um, I think that brings us to the end of our webinar for the day. And this actually concludes the end of the Nebo Company's Smart Strategies for Talent Development webinar series. And we have put on seven webinars over the last year and a half. It has been quite a journey. You can, follow, you can find all of our webinars and all of the recordings at the Nebo Company's website, www.nebocompany.com. And we would also love to hear from you about what you might want to learn more about. So if you would like to send us an email, Kate, I'll ask you to click one slide further and we'll share our email address for you. You can send us your ideas for new potential topics to leadership at nebocompany.com and we will keep you up to date on our next offering sometime later in the year. So Karen, thank you so much to you for joining us and sharing your insight and Kate, thank you as always to you and everyone, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye, everyone.